this call and, and for engaging with us uh, as you have been now for the last month. We really appreciated the opportunity as we look to reopen our practice and welcome patients back to our practice um, to share that information with you and from our planning services. Um, as well as our inf uh, infection prevention and control and some of the steps that we were taking as Mayo to safely welcome those patients back. Now we're at a place where patients have come back. We're starting to hear from them, you know, what's making them feel safe? What, what's causing that anxiety, um, you know, when they're coming into our community? And so, you know, TRIPS team has done a lot of work in really helping to understand um, that visitor experience inside our walls, but we're also getting a fair amount of information through our patient experience, um, as well as our uh, concierge services on how patients are feeling outside of our walls. And so, you know, as uh, critical and important partners for us and our patients in this community, um, you know, in addition to seeing us, they see you, they stay in your hotels, they visit your stores, they eat in the restaurants, and and, and we understand what a critical partnership that is. And so wanted to be able to share some of the information that we're gathering with you today um, and, and have the chance to, I think, have a little bit of a dialogue and answer some questions that you have. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tripp, who's our, our Vice Chair for Quality, but leads our patient experience team. Um, and I'll give you the floor, Tripp. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, and I think uh, you have some slides uh, for me, Sam. Yep, I'm, I'll pull them up right now. Great. Uh, so I, I do want to uh, thank you all, as, as Aaron said, uh, you know, this uh, opportunity to, to share with you some of the things we're hearing because I know it will have an impact. And previous research I'm sure you are aware of, you know, we all recognize that the time patients and visitors spend within our wall is, is quite limited. It's about a third of their trip. The rest are out there with you. And that has a big impact. Uh, in fact, when we look at the entire journey people take, they can't really separate what happens at, you know, the clinic from in their mind and retrospect from what happened across the community. It's just too intertwined. And so we really need to make sure that we're sending all the right messages to folks as they, they come to visit us. Now, it's not on this slide, and I am going to talk specifically really about uh, patient experience, but we really kind of changed our focus within Mayo Clinic, and we're actually now called Mayo Clinic Experience. And that's in recognition that, you know, our patients are, of course, at the center of what we're doing, but they come with someone. So we need to be focused on visitors. And oftentimes they were sent by someone. So we need to focus on the referring physician. And lots of times there's other people within our walls that are uh, here not for their own medical care, but for knowledge. So what about all the learners? And then what about our staff? And so we've really changed our name to Mayo Clinic experience and recognition that we really have to focus on the entirety of the experience. Um, and in the words of uh, Lou Carbone, who really kind of set the standard in what's called clue management, he said, everybody's having an experience. You can't not have one. And so trying to understand all those different perspectives, putting those together, and then creating a experience for everyone is really kind of the way you, you optimize it and get each of the actors in these experiences to deliver uh, on the promises that have been made. So if you could go to the next slide quick for me, Sam. So in this time right now at, at the clinic, we were doing a lot of things across experience, but we've had to really focus in. And, and what we focused in on is what are those things that will make people feel safe? confident and secure and comfortable during their Mayo Clinic visits. Uh, I'm happy to report that as we look at experience and our primary measure that we look at is likelihood to recommend uh, that our inpatient results have always been high and they're remaining high and stable. Our outpatient results took a little bit of a dip and we're starting to see them uh, return. We also, of course, much like Many other businesses across the U.S. had to figure out new models to deliver care quickly. So we quickly launched a lot of face-to-face -face videos uh, and telephone, and we saw a big dip, honestly, when we, when we first got started there. And a lot of it was around technology. And so now understanding that and trying to figure out what's the right balance. When do you have people come to visit? When is it essential to do um, the video visits uh, is something we're continue to uh, learn and understand. But one of the key points of the data that's jumped out at us is that 
people are now hyper aware of safety measures. And they're much more attuned to the clues that we're sending to folks saying, do we really care about their safety and are we serious about protecting them? Uh, and this is really being you know, delivered to us in multiple ways, but their expectations for clear communications, tell me exactly what's gonna happen, um, has really risen. And they're looking for visible signs so whether they're, they're physical signs or other evidence that safety precautions are being taken in cleanliness. So next slide, real quick, Sam. So we've tried to do a lot of things, and we actually asked our patients, do you feel the staff protected your safety? We've always asked this question, so we have about 15 years of data around this, and it had remained relatively stable. But as we started to really launch into these ideas of providing visible clues about safety and, and things we're doing to uh, care for them, um, and we'll get into those in a little bit more specific in a moment, uh, we've seen that jump up. So this is the results of about 50,000 surveys a week across Mayo Clinic outpatients. So we're confident in the data and we're confident that we've seen, seen some of the rises. Uh, next slide, Sam. We've also developed some AI engines to really start to really analyze and understand the comments that people are making. And so one of the first things we really look at is what's the sentiment of the comments? Are they, is it a positive sensitive? Is it a negative sentiment? Um, it's not perfect yet. We're continuing to tweak the, the engines, but it gives us a flavor for what all those comments are saying. So we really try to digest everything people are saying. So in the positive response, we see a lot of things about uh, appointments. The time was really talking about the amount of time it took to you know, go through the appointment efforts the staff are taking. And on the negative, of course, uh, many of you know we had a no visitor policy for a little while. That came through loud and clear that people weren't happy about that. So we've actually been the first institution in the US to try and remove those barriers for visitors. Also fascinating, and I don't have the answer to this, is Right to the right of visitor, you'll, you'll see the word husband. So I don't know why husband is showing up in the negative comments, but um, for all the men out there that in this time, I guess we as, a, as husbands have, have to do a little better job. Next slide, would you please, Sam? So when we dive through all of this data and really look to say, what are people telling us? Uh, my team here in Rochester, uh, the experience team is really kind of gone through lots and lots of different inputs, everything from the things we're hearing in our service recovery offices to comment cards to things that are uh, being collected through the surveys. And what they found is really, they wanna see visible safety precautions. They wanna know active cleaning is going on. They wanna see detailed signage in the buildings and what sanitation measures are being taken. Uh, and they wanna be able to find that information online. They want to see our staff and masks and using hand sanitizer. Uh, hand washing has always been a big one for us. This gloves one is interesting um, because we actually don't recommend gloves at this time. And so we're trying to figure out why do people uh, you know, prefer gloves. Now, yes, gloves for personal protection, but as a COVID measure, uh, we believe hand washing is, is the better way to go. But we haven't communicated that well enough to our patients, so they're making comments. Of course, they, they want to see screening of all staff and patient visitors coming in, and they really kind of expect this uh, daily temperature check piece. Um, they're expecting that we've taken the precautions, moving those things that, that get handed around, puzzles, magazines, um, and looking at the overall cleanliness of the facility. Lately, we've been hearing comments about we still have some areas that are using pens and papers, and why are we doing that, and should we be trying to eliminate that? So feeding that information back to uh, our staff uh, to try and make changes as fast as we can to really fall in line with expectations or communicate why we might be doing something different. Now, there's other questions that people are asking. You know, they want to know, you know, what are we doing to separate them from COVID patients? Are we seeing COVID patients? How many COVID patients are we seeing? Uh, are we keeping them separate? Uh, what actions are we taking to prevent uh, exposure? Interestingly enough, um, there are many comments and questions about what are we doing to protect our own staff. So not only are the patients concerned about their own safety, they'd really like to understand um, what we're doing for them. The other thing they look for and take a lot of visual uh, clues from is the demeanor of the staff. And 
are we being calm? Are we approaching things? Or do we look anxious ourselves? Right, so the patients and visitors will reflect what they see. Uh, next slide for me, Joe. Or, well, I'm looking at Joe. Thank you, Sam. I know you can't switch them for me, Joe. Uh, <laughs> one of the other things we've really worked on lately is narrating the care. And this really kind of felt a little silly to some folks up front, but if half the people know what you're doing, the other half don't. And so is there a way to actually talk people through, just in casual conversation, really the things that we're doing to protect them, to insert those messages that actually, you know, what they're seeing is on their behalf. So everything from, I'm not gonna shake your hand, I'm just gonna wave and we're doing that to protect people too, you know, I'm still cleaning the area. Thank you for your, your patience. Now, I wanted to make sure that I was exceedingly clear um, also about what are the triggers that people see that say, I don't really feel safe about this. And so, of course, the number one is not wearing gloves or masks. And we get a lot of comments about the improper wearing of masks as well, or the, the actual physical appearance of the masks. Um, you know, are they ripped? Are they torn? Do they look tattered? So we, we get comments around that. Social distancing is really a big one. That's an easy, vi easy visual clue that people are picking up on and saying, well, if they're not socially distancing, you know, are they spreading uh, things among themselves? Coughing or uh, if someone sees someone sneeze or a Kleenex laying there, um, are we taking the extra time to do the, the more thorough cleaning of the area? Um, of course, I mentioned the handshake. Lines go with the social distancing, but really are not sending the right messages. Uh, when they do eat in our cafeterias, they're really looking like, do we have clear indications that this table is actually been clean? Um, and of course, you know, elevators are of huge concern. Uh, next slide for me, Sam. So we've also talked to our concierge services, as, as um, Aaron mentioned, and we said, you know, what are the questions that you're getting? So we might be able to take a little more uh, proactive approach to, to answer some of these questions and understanding, you know, the things that are on people's minds. So with regard to lodging, they want to know who's open, how close to Mayo, what's the affordability, what's their cleaning, what's their social distancing, and, and lately we've been getting a lot of questions about your masking policies. And I want to take the opportunity, I know many of you have interacted with our concierge staff helping to provide that information. Thank you so much for your partnership in that. Um, you know, interesting, there's a, also this perception that, um, you know, somehow are we making sure that you're cleaning your, your hotels uh, properly? Um, I, I'm not exactly sure uh, how we address that at some point in the future, but it is something that patients and visitors are asking us. Um, with restaurants, again, you know, who's open, what steps are they taking, um, uh, are there options for takeout, curbside, pickup, delivery, um, and, you know, shout out to Joe Ward and his experience team for really trying to help collect all that information and make that available to the folks as well. And then lots of questions around shuttle services. Next slide, Sam. So we also do a lot of research with, with folks trying to understand um, how they're considering COVID, what are the types of things that are on their minds, um, what questions do, is that raising, and then what actions are they taking. And So um, we've partnered with a company called C-Space, and we actually have some online communities that uh, include patients and non-patients, um, uh, patients from across the, the nation, of ours and understanding what are they thinking about. So we have certain activities that we're going there. And you know, this, this number seven issue here is really talking about, well, people are really concerned about reopening a second wave and what impact a vaccine will have it. And the questions that's bringing up to them are, you know, um, how are we cleaning? What are we doing? How are we behaving in order to make them safe? Is my travel to, to Mayo really essential? Um, you know, or is enduring discomfort a little bit in this time, um, you know, really worth staying home for? And then what does my doctor think? But when we ask them, you know, what are they actually going to do or have conversations, you'll see down there. Now, slow, small sample sizes, so I, I can't project it widely, but you have about a third of the people saying, I'm planning to go on summer vacation anyway. About a third of the people saying, I'm not going anywhere. And a little over 10% of the folks saying, I can't afford to go anywhere. 
and so the impacts that they're having on these. We've taken all this information and we've really tried to distill it down for our uh, clinic members and, and others folks and say, look, there's gonna be a new normal. And in order to get to that new normal, we feel a checklist in this time might be really helpful. And so these are the highlights from what we're hearing now. And these do change. I mean, people's perceptions, uh, actions and, and you know, reactions in the greater community have a huge impact on these. But Really, here are the key elements that we need to make sure that we're walking through right now. Uh, next slide, please. We've also done a lot of work on our, our website and having people study those along with uh, collecting information and trying to distill that down and saying, what are the buckets that, that people really wanna know more information? And I think this, this first column is really one that should speak to all of us. And it's about that end-to-end -end visit. People really want to know what to expect from the moment they leave their home through their travel. Um, surprises are not good this time. Um, they want to know, you know, how the room's been cleaned. What are the things going to be happening in order to ensure my safety? What are the things you expect of me in this time period? Um, and then, you know, some of these other ideas about, you know, what's going to happen in the procedures. Are there other logistical type things that I need to make sure? Um, can you help me understand what's essential, what's not essential? And then, of course, uh, additional COVID information. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things we've also done, and uh, I'm sure you are all well aware of the, the importance for consistency is how we respond to certain things. And so I also have a group of staff in my uh, experience group that works on empathic communications and scripting. And we know there are many challenging situations that are gonna occur during this time period. And so can we think about them and provide our staff proactive ways to respond or address situations so they don't spiral out of control? So here are a couple that, that we've worked on. Um, one is, you know, we spent a lot of time calling people canceling their appointments, and now we're calling them back and saying, nope, it's safe to come right now. There's going to be questions. Why do we feel it's safe to come at this time? And can we help our staff really uh, assist in, in answering those questions in the moment, addressing the concerns of patients and families up front through empathy? We also know there's going to be times where we mess up, where we are trying to project a certain level of uh, safety and we won't have 100% uh, coverage. There's gonna be lapses of maybe someone's not wearing a mask or maybe there's some social distancing that, that hasn't occurred or some other um, piece. Can we proactively arm our staff with comments that uh, reflect and then address concerns people have in the moment? Next slide, please. But you know, this one, we're changing this tomorrow. So we've been expecting our, our staff to call um, patients and visitors and invite them back for, for messages. But our own website, for our own patient, for our own employees, we were telling them up until this point, and, and these things change over time, but when this first happened, we said, you should cancel all travel. We haven't changed that message. So still when employees went to look for, you know, what's gonna happen with the screening of our own staff, we were saying, look, you shouldn't travel, it's not safe. Well, then how can we expect our folks to turn around and then call people and say, oh no, it's safe to travel. These duality of messages. So, you know, we have to go back through things we've published in the past, make sure we're updating, correcting, and having our most recent uh, information out there so we're not causing staff these kind of double perception of what's, what's really happening. Uh, next slide, please. And so if, if I distill all that down with you, and I just wanted you to leave with, with three points about what we're trying to do here, um, those three points could be, you know, consistently safe, confident, and comfortable. Everything we need to do is to point to these. Um, and I think we can get there if we clearly communicate with guests, provide them, you know, with easy options to find the information they're looking for and clear places to call if they have additional questions. And what can we do to provide them with information up front uh, about the end-to-end -end details of their, their visit? And this is really about preparing what's gonna happen while they're with you and then uh, what happens 
if something uh, after they leave occurs. Um, someone was known in the, in the hotel to have COVID or other things uh, might be important. Um, again, you know, I was just kind of sharing, you know, one of the messages that we saw duality in with, with our own staff, but what are you sharing with your staff? Those folks who are greeting the, the customers and uh, guests that are coming to your desks or interacting with you in your own hallways, do your staff know your safety plans? Um, and do they have scripts available so they can consistently respond to questions that, that you know are coming? And then finally, looking at those visual clues, you're providing new clues that you're taking extra steps to, to um, protect their safety or remove ones that are uh, perhaps causing people to question what's really going on behind the scenes. Um, you know, these clues about safety and comfort are really gotta be a top priority because we're all taking in uh, so many clues from our environment uh, and they have to be consistent for, for guests and staff. Um, so with that, I think that's my last slide. I appreciate your attention so much and, and would be glad to take any questions that you might have. Trip, this is Kathleen um, with the Chamber. If I could just ask um, for, for you to drop any Minnesota nice here and tell us all when, um, what patients say when they have those concerns and what's the level of emotional, what's their emotional temperature? when they see the dissonance between inside and outside Mayo? Um, so, uh, you know, honestly, Kathleen, uh, for about a week after it happened, we were getting very angry calls and letters about Mike Pence's visit. Mm -hmm. So here's a very visible individual clearly going into a clinical space, should know everything about uh, COVID because he's leading the nation's response. Uh, and going against their own recommendation and Mayo Clinic's policy that we are uh, going to require masks when people are with us. The amount of feedback and input we got from both patients and staff was enormous, and it was uh, very emotional and very strong. Um, a lot of people now, well, they follow through with these, these different steps, but that is something that undermines your credibility. And I don't have it in this presentation here today, but really when we think about experience, we're really thinking about um, it's all about trust. And so we are and keeping your promises. Um, and so we are constantly trying to evaluate what are the promises that we're making. So in this case, we promised that we'd keep people safe. Well, what's the evidence? Here's the vice president not wearing a mask. Um, you know, and I know lots of things, and in hindsight, we, we could have done things otherwise, but when we mess up, we hear. It. And uh, we're probably only hearing from a small section of, of folks. Um, you know, lots of things that transpired from there. It's interesting that that was even an action of someone who wasn't a Mayo Clinic employee, um, that we would get that such a, a reaction from. So yeah. I do and think people are scared. And Kathleen, you know, and, and I would just add, you know, some of the comments that our, um, that our uh, concierge services has heard, you know, when, when people are entering hotels and not seeing people masked or socially distanced or, you know, those are things we hear and, and they are emotional about it. You know, I think to Tripp's point, you know, people are, are, are wanting to see that commitment to safety, you know, not just inside of our walls, but, but outside of our walls. And so I think in, in, Trip's point around the visibility of those things, I think, is so important. They're looking for visible cues. You know, are people wearing masks? Do you have things that are set up that allow for social distance, whether it's, you know, stickers on the floor or X's that, you know, keep people six feet apart? You know, are we doing some of those things collectively as a community that are really helping us um, uh, show those visible signals? Because I think that gives them confidence, not just what's happening in front of their faces, but what's happening in terms of your cleaning policies and other things that they may not see as clearly. Thanks, Erin. Are there other questions for, for Trip? Well, I, I think maybe we could go to Joe and talk about um, what is happening and the, the thinking at the community level for, for raising the bar and showing how much we have, how we have to collectively raise the bar. Joe? 
Yeah, Kathleen, thank you very much um, for having me. And hopefully I can summarize some of the conversations that have been going on that everybody, a lot of people haven't seen yet, but will shortly. And I really I want to thank Aaron and Tripp, especially because a lot of the information that's informing an effort that we're underway on um, is really coming from them as well as um, industry information. And we're hearing really the same things. Obviously here they're going to be more specific to Rochester, but the industry as a whole, uh, whether it's a meeting planner or a potential guest, uh, is, is really concerned about the safety. Whereas we're in the hospitality industry, we always used to like to hide, you know, how the sausage is made. Um, and in this case, we have to, we're gonna have to show, um, you know, safety, cleanliness, and all these different elements, hygiene, um, so we can go forward. And so with that being said, it, we've really got a lot of feedback. And when I say we, I mean Kathleen with the chamber, I mean um, Holly at RDA, the DMC, uh, Mayo, of course, the city, um, Olmstead Health, that we have all heard sort of the same thing and we've had lots of local, whether it's a retailer or a hotel, asking, well, what, what can we do? And then the truth is a lot of that information is already out there. I don't know if there's anything necessarily novel in what we hear, but we did find that there's a need to actually compile this information. And so there's been a group effort going on for about the you know, last week or so, maybe a little longer to try to compile this and then get it out to you in the hospitality community. Uh, and so Aaron's been heavily involved with that as well as Kathleen who are here right now to really kind of make a concise sort of program that we can then implement. And when I say we, or this case, it's really gonna take everybody here to implement it. So we're gonna try to package it, give you some tools to communicate with your guests in a language that they understand you know we love the health department but they're not notorious for their great design skills in the back of the kitchen with all these great posters we have to put up um, so we're going to try to speak in the language that we know visitors want to hear which is and then show some visual elements um, that certainly are, are getting done and, and be a resource for you so i would say um, from my read on the situation we haven't had a specific rollout date but we're really trying to put this together quickly and so i would say in the next uh, week to two weeks, you're going to be hearing a lot more from us on this front as we continue to, to move forward and as restaurants realizing that they're going to be open for outdoor dining right now or starting June 1st, um, but hopefully very shortly after that, be able to welcome guests inside. And I think it's more important here than probably any other destination in the country, perhaps. And that's because we're the home of the Mayo Clinic. And so there is this expectation that Rochester is going to be ready, that Rochester needs to be ready for visitors and that perhaps we've always been ready. And so maybe we know a little bit of, hey, we're learning and changing some things, but when visitors get here, we want them to feel like we were prepared for this all along. And I would say that, you know, I've been, as a newcomer to Minnesota, I've been very impressed with how the Mayo Clinic really did seem to be ready for a scenario like this to unfold, including Olmstead Public Health. And I um, think Minnesota's, in this, my opinion, doing, done a fantastic job of really trying to, of you know, lowering the curve. Now I realize that that's had tremendous impact on everybody in this virtual room at the moment. And I think it's getting old for a lot of us. So we all wanna, we all wanna open back up. Um, but on the subject at hand, essentially, um, the, the team at Experience Rochester will be working with the other partners, continue to work with them. And we're really just part of the implementation phase. We, when we had this meeting a couple weeks ago, really the, the element was, well, do you have the capacity to be able to start to, to implement this? And you know, the question was kind of like, well, implement kind of what? So we needed the health folks to be involved because we have to make sure that whatever we're suggesting to people is in line with the actual expectations of health professionals. I mean, so when we put something out in the community, there will be a link back to a website um, that actually shows the body of the scene of this program. So what you may have in front of your visitors might be more concise, might be some real visual elements that show you're part of a program, sort of an opt-in initiative, not a certification per se, um, but an initiative that you're able to opt in. And then if for more information, they can go to the, this very small probably website where you would see the backbone of what that's all about and certainly be free to answer or ask and um, ask any questions and receive feedback from the group. And the key to it is communication. So we make sure we're hearing the right questions. Um, and, the, and, and if we don't know them, we know the partners to reach out to. And so, um, you know, there's no pretty slides at this moment. I know next month, I'm positive by next month, we'll have the uh, 
the visuals to go along with this and hopefully already by then some results. And uh, so Kathleen, Aaron, you've obviously been involved in those discussions. Really, if there's anything more um, that you'd like to add, um, certainly now would, would be a great time or if there's, if there's any questions about that, I think, um, you know, it's sometimes you don't, we don't see the work that goes on behind the scenes and, and really everybody's really trying to understand a way to help you all recover. Um, and, and help us all recover. You know, we lost about 75% of our revenue here at the Civic Center and um, and because of the lodging tax, as well as the fact that we're closed and probably will be for months, will perhaps be the last ones to really open. But that's the reality we live in. And then, and as uh, Andy had mentioned at the very beginning, that quote that he read from me, that came back from when I was hired and obviously optimistic coming to town and opportunities in the air. But truthfully, that still remains to be true. You know, this is a time that everything's been reset for us. And Rochester has a part to play as the safest destination in the country. Um, and somebody, a place that you can all, your guests can look forward to coming and feeling comfortable. I wouldn't say letting their guard down, but feeling amongst any other destination in the country, that this is a place where they actually can be comfortable. And, and in the event that something were to happen, there's those health resources, you know, a block or two away um, from your establishment. So um, anyway, Kathleen, that's kind of back to you if you have anything else on that. Aaron, do you want to add more first about this effort? Maybe not. Um, well, I, if I could just, uh, just repeat, and I think this is something that for those of you who are um, part of larger organizations, it's so important to take this up to manage your managers that there will be a program that will be rolled out um, within the community built on the public health standards, not necessarily creating new standards, but built on the public health standards and showing the commitment to um, compliance and execution of those standards through visual elements and um, hopefully create this community identity of excellence and support and belief that um, all should be done and done according to those standards. Um, so it's, I think it's so important, please pass that up, down, whatever the chain, so they know this is not going to be creating new standards. Um, and it will be though providing you the opportunity to show the commitment to them. Um, and many of you have corporate standards that you're just dis you're displaying to so this would not supplant that it would be in addition to but hopefully community-wide um, is that fair Joe yeah absolutely I'm really glad you said that about the uh, the, the that everyone would, would you to opt in you're really trying to achieve those standards and, and work towards them it's not you know it's it's not a true enforcement mechanism but this is a very visual way and a commitment and we realize like you know restaurants in particular they have, they're going to have some very strict guidelines with public health and um, hotels were you know, considered necessary, so didn't necessarily have something laid out to them. Um, some of the big brands obviously have, have taken on their own cleanliness and safety programs. Um, but I think these will all help reinforce it and bring it to a local level because, you know, I mean, as we like to really look at all these things so deeply, but some of our guests, you know, they'll just walk in a place and it's sort of like, you know, you glance at the BBB, you know, the Better Business Bureau sticker in the window and in some way you feel better, right? And not necessarily sure what the BBB does, but um, but you feel better. And so this this would be some visual elements like that. But for, and but it's not just flash as a sticker. It's something that there is the meat behind it. And we will again. I think you're all already trying to achieve those. This is just a way to communicate that um, to the community. Um, so Kathleen, great great addition to that. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And and I just want to tell you from the chamber perspective, we oftentimes hear um, of people's concerns. And to be honest, there's been a number of them, and a number of them from down, you know, from people downtown, and and it really comes in the form of shock of the difference between the inside Mayo experience and the outside Mayo experience. And while there's not a desire to have mandatory masking, um, there is a desire for everyone in this community to understand and appreciate and respect. The need of the patients and each other to see um, some of those visual cues uh, 
and especially masking, but I cannot tell you how frustrating it is to get emails from people saying, I'm coming to this, the greatest destination for health and wellness in the world. Um, and, you know, the hotel I just walked into, the, the, uh, and there's not a receptionist with a mask on. Um, and that says to that consumer that it is not safe. Right or wrong, we, perception is reality. And, you know, from a competitive perspective, as a business owner, the perceptions are so, so important. But for our largest employer and our guests, it is, it is critical. So, Erin, do you want to add anything? You know, Kathleen, I, I just would say, you know, thank you for, for these comments and, and um, just reiterate, you know, how, uh, how much we're grateful for the work that you are all doing as you look at reopening and, and, and you know, hopefully this information is helpful. And, and Kathleen and Tripp, I think both alluded to the fact, you know, people's, people's experience isn't just inside the walls at Mayo, it's, it's inside your hotels and, and restaurants and uh, retail locations. And so I think all, the more we can do to continue to partner um, is gonna be critical as we welcome uh, guests and visitors and patients back into our community. So again, just would say thank you for, for your time today. Are there questions from folks? Yeah, uh, Kathleen, Sam here. Looks like we got a question in the chat. Um, they're wondering, can Mayo, so uh, Tripp or Aaron, comment on food service hours and protocols for serving? Um, and then more specifically, what sanitation is taking place in waiting areas? <coughs> uh, oh, thanks for the question. I was looking for the hours of uh, Food, I don't know um, that I should start a chat with one of our concierges. Um, and then the uh, deep cleaning uh, protocols that, that we're using um, for the uh, common areas as well as the uh, kind of clinical rooms, we'll, we'll have to do a follow up on that as well. I don't have that at my fingertips either. Okay, other questions? Okay, well, uh, serious, very serious business, really necessary to link arms and ensure that we are seen as a community of concern and caring, compassion and compliance. Um, and those visible cues are absolutely invaluable, but you know, the real deal is, is there's gotta be a commitment to it. Um, stay tuned for more information about this, um, non-certification certification program <laughs> um, but it's critical and we're so fortunate in this community to have Joe Ward with us um, he's bringing a level of expertise for this kind of um, external um, uh, communications and operations and planning to our community that we is critical at this time so Joe we're so pleased you're here and so grateful um, and we're so grateful to all of you who are doing every, you know, everything possible. Um, and it's just, the, we cannot let up and it should be consistent. And think of it as you know, compassion, but also think of it as good business. This is good business practice um, and it is critical. So Andy, do you um, have anything else to add? Uh, yes, I was just going to uh, mention that I think a number of hotels have taken a lot of positive steps and, and we applaud what people have done from wearing masks to putting up stickers to putting up plex dividers and those are awesome steps and I think our guests have really uh, responded uh, well to them. I know that a number of uh, hotels changed the transportation process so if you are restarting it, as I'm hearing that some are doing next week, if you can uh, put in the chat that you're doing that, we can make sure that's going through both the chamber channels, the Mayo channels, as well as experience Rochester channels. Because uh, that's really important to know that you do have uh, shuttle service because that is a valuable uh, benefit uh, for our patient uh, visitors. 
Also, uh, Sam, can you highlight the latest list of seminars uh, coming up? Because I know uh, there's one today, and I just want to make sure everybody is thoughtfully updated on that. Well, there has been a change to some of those schedules, Andy, so um, I'm sorry, Sam, go ahead. I was just going to actually turn it to you, Kathleen. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, there has been a change to some of those um, schedules. We will not be having one today. There will be one on Tuesday um, with Dan Messenberg, who's on here um, on this webinar. He's amazing and will once again do a webinar on the deep dive for restaurants and bars. Um, and D Dan, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you want to make any comments about um, what you're hearing or what you are might be offering? Very unfair of me to do that. Are you still with us, Dan? Well, it will be incredibly valuable. Again, it's a sign of um, uh, incredible focus and um, uh, it will be on Tuesday at 3 p.m. Knowing that we'll be doing the, out the outdoor dining will start on, um, on Monday. And in light of that, I'd like to just inform people of a, um, one of the advocacy efforts the chamber is taking. Um, and we have not heretofore had any issues with the governor's um, opening uh, requests and, and, and path. But we have, um, along with the mayor, and um, uh, have communicated with the governor and have offered a, and su suggested respectfully that serious consideration should be considered to increasing indoor dining capacity to 25%. Um, that is, again, with the belief that people are very, very serious about being ready, which I think this sector is. So if you are interested, we'll have last call, um, so to speak, for signing this petition, which you could um, get, and Sam's posted it there on the, um, uh, it's on our website. So uh, we will be sending that out to the governor today. I think we have probably over 200 signatures. Um, and finally, um, something that is hopefully fun. And uh, we're trying to do, we're gonna be doing our annual member community celebration in a different way this year, since we can't be at the, um, Hilton and we can't be at the Civic Center, we're going to ask people to um, celebrate community from their couch. So this um, June 4th on Thursday night from 7 to 8 30, there's going to be a live streamed concert with um, local music, um, Loudmouth Brass, and a uh, band Fabulous Armadillos and Collective Unconscious. They'll be doing their Eagles band, uh, their Eagles cover, they are amazing if you haven't seen them. We hopefully, hopefully everybody will tune in. We thank our sponsors, ABC6, The Castle, Mayo, um, and Wells Fargo. Um, details again on the website, YouTube. Order food from your favorite carryout. Sit with your family, your few friends. Um, rock out on your couch or in your living rooms. And uh, please, please tune in. This should be fun um, and, it, and no, it will be fun. And we let's be together virtually and celebrate one another and celebrate the resiliency that we have had so far and the path forward that we're gonna be taking together as a community to, to recover strongly. So um, John Reed is saying in, in the chat that he would like to work. John, do you wanna make your comment verbally? Absolutely, Kathleen. Thank you. Um, you know, with the drawdown, um, our uh, taxi cab situation as well as uh, shuttle buses is really, um, really slipped. And again, would love to work with all the hotels. Maybe we can come up with some signage um, with contact numbers. We do find occasionally people that are searching for ground transportation. Sometimes they just don't Uber. Um, and, and they're usually headed to a hotel of some type and gladly work with all the hotels, um, gather information. We'd work on some temporary signage till we begin to return to, to somewhat of a normal. 
but um, again, just I, I put my email in the chat for anybody who'd like to 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 give us uh, um, some contact information, and we'd go from there. Thank you, John. Really important point, um, and we're about I think time. I want to from from all of us thank Aaron and Trip and Joe for joining us today for all their incredible work for sharing the insight of patients. It's amazingly invaluable. Um, and we appreciate you, um, you doing that. Uh, if there yeah. isn't anything else, Andy, I think we could adjourn. Um, yes, I was just gonna ask, John, could you comment on current restaurant, excuse me, on current airport traffic at this time at RST? Absolutely. Um, uh, as of now, um, and, and that does change, um, Delta is running uh, one flight a day to Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, United and American are both flying five flights a week to Chicago O'Hare. What's, what's the passenger load like, John? Uh, passenger loads are, are very low. Uh, I do think we fit in with the national norms. Yesterday, uh, 235 or 36,000 people flew nationally. That's down from about 2.6 million. Um, we're bouncing in around that 100 a day. Um, depending upon the day, it can be less. Okay. Let's, thank you, and thanks so much for your leadership of the airport. Okay. Um, Andy, can we sign off? Yes, thanks so all to all of you for attending and giving of your time and energy. We look forward to a vibrant and improved summer ahead in the world of hospitality. Take care. Thank you, Andy. Stay Thank safe. You, Stay Thank well. You.